like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Good morning. And welcome to the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit on this wonderful Labor Day. We're going to be talking about loving the labor in our life. It's it's a a great spiritual practice, this process of loving whatever it is that we do and cherishing it, mastering it. In our bulletin, we have an invocation that we'll say also three times, softer and softer. Then we'll sit in the silence for four or five minutes to allow the revelation of this truth to become one with our awareness, one with our beingness, together. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence and one power in the universe and in my life, God the good, omnipotence. There is only one presence. There is only one power. We live, we breathe, we move, all within this very presence of God. In every situation, there is only God. In our neighbor, there is only God. At our workplace, in our home, in the traffic jam, there is only God. Let us feel the love just for a moment. Go inside the heart and feel love born of the silence. Feel Soften, breathe into the heart. In all things, there is love. In all things, there is God. And now let us finish by praying as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power. And the glory. Forever and ever. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, in this wonderful Labor Day weekend, we're going to be speaking of loving our labor. I start by telling the story of the, the young man, the eager young man, eager to wake his, make his way to the top, who went to a well-known millionaire businessman and asked him the first reason for his success. The businessman answered without any hesitation. He said, hard work. And the young man was silent for a moment. And then he said, well, I guess really I wanted the second reason for your success. <laughs> we all want the deal. We all want this sort of easy way in life that just, you know, where life comes to us. There's, there's something about a, a Labor Day weekend psychologically that sort of says it's the end of summer, even though we may have another six weeks of, of wonderful weather for, for lucky. But uh, it's just, it just, it sort of shifts the season even a little prematurely. So I'd, I'd ask everyone here, how's your work going? The work filled with love? Everything going well at work? Friendly relations with your coworkers? This, f- this f- sense of being on fire with your, your work? Like you're, you're living for this wonderful cause? I find it 
sometimes helpful to remember the, the story of the little girl. I think this came from the story of the 60s, who had three older brothers who always got to mow the lawn. And uh, she looked up to him, and so she really wanted to mow the lawn every year. The parents said, oh, you're too young, you're too young, you're too young. And until finally that year came where she could mow the lawn. So she goes out the first time that uh, the yard needs to be mowed and mows away and, you know, just does a wonderful job, sort of to everyone's surprise, just does a wonderful job. And then she starts, and she's so happy with this, and she starts looking at a neighbor's yard that needs trimming, needs cutting. And the neighbor's out there and says, well, Sally, you did a wonderful job. Would you like to mow my yard? And Sally goes, yes. And the man says, well, how about $3? And Sally's face drops, and she's just almost in despair. She starts walking away, and the man said, what's wrong, Sally? And she said, I only have $2. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so how many of us would pay to go to work? <laughs> so, I, uh, I was reading about, actually, this is a, uh, a, a stock trader who was sort of giving this talk on achieving greatness in trading stocks. Of course, this could apply for anyone in business. It could apply to secretaries or school teachers or doctors or lawyers or whatever. But uh, he said there are many people who want to do extremely well and want to make money, but there are few people who think of themselves as being great at what they do. It's, it's, it's a big leap to shift into thinking that you are great. He mentioned that Abraham Maslow, you know, the uh, sort of the psychologist who would, you know, who did all these studies on peak states of awareness and peak performance. And Abraham Maslow would ask the students in his class to raise their hands if they expected to achieve greatness in their profession. And inevitably, no hands would be raised. You know, they, they just, just, just didn't. And he's, this fellow was saying, what happens is when people pour themselves into their work and just really go for it and take every action they can possibly take to improve themselves and just really apply themselves, is that they start developing habits that lead to greatness. They start to do their job really, really well, or their business, or whatever it is. They become masters at it. And it's a big shift from going to work and doing your job, even reasonably well, or well enough as most people will do their jobs, to really putting your heart out into it and making this decision to master this field of your endeavor. And once you master any one field, what happens is those same habits apply or transfer over to every other field that you want to do, your hobby or your family or, or whatever. And the question that this story brought to my mind, this fellow's sort of small talk, was how does this apply to our walk with God? You know, are we really stepping out and saying, yes? 100%, I'm going to master this process. Most of us go in waves. That is, we sort of build up our enthusiasm and sort of, and sort of crescendo for a period, and then we fade. And we build it back up again and fade, and up and up, and you know, back and forth. The first time we do this, we call it the honeymoon, because everything is so sweet on the spiritual path, and then all the work comes in, and we go, oh, whoa. I think I mentioned the, that over in India, they, uh, they have the saying when they see someone who's really happy, they say, oh, you must have found a new guru. <laughs> because cause in the beginning, <laughs> everything's all a bed of roses, and then the guru makes them go to work. <laughs> and it's not that much fun anymore. They go find another guru. <laughs> you know, let's, let's have this romance again. You know, rather than applying themselves to master all the tendencies that we have in our lives, the tendencies to really focus on ourselves rather than serving. Because what we'll find as we go through life is the only real work that matters 
is that of service. Other work is good for money, and but if you can do it with a sense of service, then suddenly, you know, like little Sally, work becomes a very different creature. So there's this sort of lure of this uh, of, of this easy way of of not having to work at all, and there's you know there's there's a perspective on that 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 if we get in tune with God, that our life does flow very easily. You know, Jesus says, you know, give me your burdens, lay your burdens at my feet, my yoke is easy. So, but the work involved, the mastery involved, is in the alignment with this presence of Christ. That's, that's the labor. That's the work. Because once we're aligned, it is a smooth and easy path. You know, Jesus had a, uh, a classic ministry in a sense in that the first couple of years it was really an easy path. Jesus was doing these miracles, crowds were showing up, you know, everybody loved him. It was just like wonderful and perfect and couldn't, couldn't be looking better, you know, couldn't be looking rosier. But, uh, and, at, and at one point, in fact, right at this point, Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answers very enthusiastically, you are the Christ, the living Son of God. A very, very dramatic moment in this, this walk with Jesus. But then Jesus sort of shifts. He begins to tell them that the crowds are going to fade and turn away. Let me read this sort of prediction of his death from Matthew 16. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke, rebuke Jesus. Isn't that great? <laughs> you got to love Peter. He said, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Very different perception. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. And then there you have this, this teaching of service, surrender, rather than of living for looking out for number one. He said, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now one thing I really love about that is that, once again, Jesus is confirming that the kingdom of heaven is a state of consciousness. Because... Had Jesus come, as is literally interpreted in the Bible, on this, you know, clouds coming from the east, you know, arriving into Israel, you know, we would have heard about it. There would have been this, this wonderful uh, recognition that, that Christ has returned and the kingdom of God is, is at hand and, you know, Jesus would raise up an army or his host would come. But Jesus says very specifically, some who are standing here will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom before they, pay, they taste death. Well, the way I read this is, some of these disciples will be enlightened, some will not. They will see the Son in all of his glory. But in terms of Jesus' work, and he had clearly a, a huge global work that he was doing, shifting the world from its very hard state into one of far more mercy, far more lovingness. And if you look at the world today after 2,000 years compared to how it was 2,000 years ago, it's hard to see it because we still see injustice, we still see genocide, we still see terrible things. But 2,000 years ago, it was so much more the norm. They would never have a Geneva Convention 2,000 years ago. They would never have anything like this. The world has really shifted. 
one of the things about about our work, you know, we talk about Jesus' work and the, and the work that he accomplished, giving this sort of spiritual push to humanity that we might see and perceive and know the Christ, is that, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, a personal application to seeing what Jesus did and what he went through to what each one of us see in our own lives and the work that we do. I went to a conference a number of years back, a very good conference on Christianity and business. And the, the nutshell kernel of wisdom that I came back with was, my business is my altar. And wherever we go to work, our business is our altar, whether we own the business or whether we're employed there. When we go to home, my home is my altar. It's true for all of us. Where, wherever we are is our altar. And it's there that we are to walk with Christ. And we do that through service. And part of this is, is having a, a clear perspective on what the world is about. A, I read a, 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 an article about a fellow who was several years back was watching this documentary about Mother Teresa. And uh, he said it was amazing. You know, all, all the astounding things that Mother Teresa does, all the lepers she deals with, all the destitute, the poor, the, you know, the sick, and she just hugs them and holds them and loves them. But he said what was even more amazing was the contrast between the show and the commercials. <laughs> and the sequence went like this. You know, uh, caring for lepers, then an ad for bikinis for sale. <laughs> Mass starvation, an ad for designer jeans. Agonizing poverty, and then fur coats. Abandoned babies, ice cream sundaes, and the diamond, uh, and the dying, and diamond watches. <laughs> we need a little balance here. <laughs> a, a little shift. I heard of another story of a, uh, a very well-dressed European woman who was on a safari in Africa. And the, the group stopped very briefly at this hospital for lepers. Very intense heat. Flies were buzzing. And uh, she noticed a, a nurse kneeling in the dirt, tending to the sort of the pus-filled wounds of a leper. And the woman sort of with disdain said, why, I wouldn't do that for all the money in the world. The nurse looked up at her and said, neither would I. <laughs> neither would I. <laughs> and, you know, if, if we don't see the world with a compassionate heart, all the awareness, all the meditation, all the enlightenment, it really doesn't count for much. It may be a wonderful thing to experience, but until it gets shifted into this practical realization that we're seeing our fellow men and our fellow women as our brothers and our sisters. We're seeing them in terms of ourselves. Unless we have this compassion, we're just kidding ourselves. We're just kidding ourselves. Do you all remember the story in the Bible where Jesus is hanging on the cross and two other thieves, robbers, are, are hanging on the cross on their own crosses right next to him? So one of the robbers looks over to Jesus and, uh, and says, of course, this is a paraphrase, he says, what are you doing here? If you're so great, why don't you save yourself? But the other robber on the other side of Jesus says, in effect, I can see you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. My friend and I, we're guilty. We deserve to be here. But you haven't done a thing. And the Bible is course, has values on many levels, but on a very symbolic level, we are every part of the Bible. And there's a part of us that sort of does the looking out for number one thing. That's the first robber. Then there's a part of us that sees the presence of God everywhere. And that's the second robber. That even in this agonizing situation that he's in, you know, and compare that to your desk job. 
Okay. <laughs> Even in this agonizing situation that he's in, he sees the Christ. And what does Jesus say? He says, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's what comes from seeing the Christ. You know, the man wasn't suddenly zapped and, and taken off the cross. It's this process that when we see the Christ, when we see God, we are in paradise. So the question we have today is, as we talk about loving the labor in our life, is which, which man on the cross do we want to be? And I say, we want to be Jesus. <laughs> but the first step to that is moving towards that man who can see Christ in everyone. Part of that is just living in gratitude. No matter what we have, living in gratitude. There's a, a wonderful Jewish story about a man who served his king very well and the king was very happy with him and the king granted him a gift. He said, I'm just going to give you, you know, this sum of money at the beginning of every year. You've been such a great servant all these years and you're just free to have this money and, and, and live your life. So the man would go out every day. He would get this big sum of money and every day he'd go out to buy provisions, food, that sort of thing for his family. But each day, before he'd go out to the market, he'd go and stand at the gates of the king and just silently give thanks to the king for that gift that he'd given them. One of his friends said to him, why do you bother to go stand there? And he just explained what he did. He says, you know, this money is not really my money. It's the gift of the king. And I get it. And then I can go buy food for my family. And for each one of us, you know, we think, oh, this is my money. This is my life. This is my body. And on a deeper level, it's the gift of the king. And the more we go into gratitude, the more our life is blessed. And it's not just that loving and serving is, is a good thing to do. I mean, on a very practical level, all the patriarchs, for example, tithed. You know, Abraham gave 10% to Melchizedek. Isaac gave 10% and reaped a hundredfold, what the Bible says. You know, I, I, I once read a, uh, a book on, I can't even remember the, the book now, but uh, and the, the, the fellow said, listen, if you will go out and, it's called Seed Money in Action. And the guy's name was, was Murphy. And he said, if you will donate some extra money above your tithes, you will see a tenfold response. And I read that and I said, how could that be? And, you know, I had $500. It was really amazing. This is 1975 or something like this, 76. And, but I had an extra $500. So I donated it, donated it to the TM Center. They bought a, one of the first video machines they had there. And uh, I was just going to test it, you know, because it was like such an outrageous claim. And within three months... Three months, I, mean, I was a, uh, doing this multi-level thing back then. I was trying to make a rich, rich, easy life for myself, which is not the multi-level way, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I called up one of the old real estate agents I used to work with. I used to be a real estate agent. And I hadn't seen him for three, four years, something like that. And I uh, called him up and made an appointment. I, I, was, I was embarrassed to say what it was about. I said, hey, George, can we get together? He goes, well, sure. I said, how about, you know, we meet. I was going to give him this, you know, 15-minute pitch on becoming a, a multi-level, you know, I was recruiting. You know, what you do to your old friends. <laughs> but anyway, I, I get there. And uh, I start going to my little spiel. And he's there with his wife, and they're sort of stunned. And they say, you're, uh, you're not here about your commission check. I said, I said, what commission check? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, that big, it was a 30-unit apartment complex, or 13, I forget, it was a big apartment complex. 
and I had a, a small piece of it. I, I was sort of like the introduction to the whole thing, but I'd left, I'd gone. Actually, this must have been 1980 because I'd gone off to Israel for a couple months and got my cities there. It was a, a wonderful experience living in Israel. But anyway, I'd come back, and he said, well, he said, yeah, we tried to find you. I don't think he looked too hard. <laughs> he said, we tried to find you, but you're due some commission. And it was $5,500. Okay? It's, you know, the, the ten times that just popped into my eye. Uh, clueless. Just clueless. So every time, and it's, whether we give time, we give money, or whatever it is, it comes back. It comes back. It's like this law of nature. It has to come back. It's like you, you plant a, a little seed and then you know, a huge corn comes back. You know, you get ten times many, many uh, corn stalks or corn, corn heads, whatever they're called. What are those called? Corn cobs. <laughs> You know, I, I wouldn't guarantee that, but, but I will say to you, you know, the, the, the churches and the religions that are very strict in their tithing and really enforce it, specifically that's the Jewish and the Mormon traditions. You know, there's others that, that say it, but those traditions end up being very wealthy. So I, I think it's the giving. And, and, of course, you know, in Deuteronomy it says give with a loving heart. In fact, they get very specific about the problem. They, like the Jewish sages talk about this. They say, if you are not giving with an open heart, you don't get the full blessing. So that, that sort of answers your questions. But what they say is the way you can tell when you're not giving with a full and open heart is you tend to delay the giving. Okay? And, you know, I, I have certainly found this. You know, oh, yes, I'm going to give it to this group. Oh, you know, and the, the thing sits on my, on my desk for three weeks before I finally sort of begrudgingly write the check because I, I owe it at that time because of my commitment. Mm -hmm. And that's not quite the same thing as having this open heart loving and giving and, you know, blessing the money as it goes out. You know, I'm sort of condemning the money as it goes out. It's not, not, a, not a good thing, you know. <laughs> I mean, in fact, I'll tell you all, one great spiritual practice is Every check you write, every bill you pay, bless them. Bless them. Okay? Instead of going, oh, there's so many bills, this and this and this. You know, just bless them and bless them and bless them. But I t I'll tell you another really wonderful story about giving. This is in a, a, an article in the uh, Toronto Star some years ago. The headline says, the girl weeps as jet passengers give. And what happened was there was a flight from Israel to London on a, a jumbo jet. And there's a four-year-old girl, very charming little girl apparently, and somehow it got out that she was going for some very uh, costly liver tests and treatment, that she was facing death. And, you know, the word got out and someone emptied out their little suitcase, you know, that goes up on the bin above, and somehow got the stewardess to make an announcement about this. And so they passed this suitcase through the jumbo jet for this girl, and they raised $97,000. $97,000. Apparently a couple of British you know, millionaires kicked in a bunch. But, you know, the thing was overflowing, and they actually sent it around a second time just to show everyone how generous the, the plane had been. But imagine, the reason I tell the story is, imagine the feeling that everyone had on that plane. You know, that's the blessing. That's the gift. That's the love. Yes? Their latest research is that we are wired to give. We're, we're wired to be nice to each other. And when we do that, every gift or act of kindness creates all those happy things. All those, all those endomorphins and the, the, giving, uh, the giving soma shows up. <laughs> the soma plan is really the act of giving, huh? <laughs> There's another story, a very old Jewish tradition about where God decided to build the temple. And the story goes that there were two brothers who were in the, the grain grinding business. They had a, a flour mill. And, you know, they lived in separate homes and they loved each other a lot. And one man was married and had, you know, a wonderful family. And the other man was not. It had just not worked out. And the man 
who was married. You know, they'd each take out some flowers, some, you know, the profits for their own home, their own use. The man who was married said, you know, when I get old, I'm going to have a family to take care of me, and my brother won't. He said, so I'm going to bring back some of this flour and put it back into the business so that he'll be, have an extra blessing of wealth when he gets older. And the brother who had no family said, you know, here I am. I've got no family to support. My brother has his family to support. I'm going to bring back <laughs> much of my flour into the business so he's got plenty to support his family. And one day, this went on for years, they bring back, you know, secretly, they bring back their flower. And one day, they met, and they realized what each one were doing. And that's the spot where the temple was built. You know, where we meet in love, where we meet in kindness, a temple is built in our own lives. If you want to become a temple of the living God, it comes from giving. And I'll say one last thing on this before we uh, close this. One of the things that Jesus said, is this, it's so extraordinary when you understand it in the context of the times. You know, the, the, every good Jewish young man, and therefore all the women know it also, but everyone, is this, the one prime law in Judaism, the Shema. You know, the Lord thy God is one. Okay, and and they're, every time they, they, that's, that's, the, uh, that's sort of their golden key. Whatever happens, the Lord thy God is one. You know, that's sort of like saying there's only one presence and one power. And you know, who would ever think of changing that? Yeah, because it's given by God. Well, the only person, to my knowledge, that ever modified that at all was Jesus. It's sort of, it's, let's put this in context. You know, we have the Lord's Prayer. Would any of us dare to add a clause or two to the Lord's Prayer? You go, no, we, we never would do that. When Jesus was asked, what, you know, is, is the most important teaching? He says, the Lord thy God is one, and, and love the God, thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul. And then he adds to that. And he said, the second commandment is, love your neighbor as yourself. He says, on these two laws hang all the commandments all the prophets, all the teachings. So it takes it from being just a spiritual path into being a spiritual path with this heart of giving, with this heart of service. So that's where we're loving our labor will take us. So let's... Ooh. Well, our, our late guests aren't going to come. I know, we want Lo, uh, Shemaine to sing us a song. And that'll be our little meditation prayer to end the, end the talk. In this very room There's quite enough love For one like me And in this very room There's quite enough joy Quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away any gloom for Jesus, Lord Jesus. Lord.
Lord Jesus is in this very room and in this very room there's quite enough love for all the world and in this very Jesus, Lord Jesus.